I'm Andrea Gaynor. I'm a professor of history at the University of Western Australia uh, and I'm an environmental historian. In this paper I'm talking about the food system in Australia during the Second World War. There were a lot of extra demands placed on the Australian food system in the context of war. There were lots of allied service people in the region that Australia had to feed and they wanted to maintain uh, exports to Britain as well and of course feed the civilian population. So I'm looking at how the government tried to mobilise the people in order to grow more food and how they restructured the food system to cope with the additional demands. Um, they did that through mechanisation, uh, food rationing, but also urging people to grow their own food. So I trace some of the implications of that campaign and how it played out. I look at the problems relating to inputs that were encountered. There were difficulties finding pesticides, fertilisers uh, and labour and also the way in which the campaign to entice people to grow their own food uh, re-inscribed existing gender relations uh, and class relations, uh, ethnic relations. Thanks. I'm talking about the past, but I'm also, in doing that, I think, hoping to encourage us to think about the present. Uh, in 2000, some of you might recall, there was a fuel strike in Britain which saw shops come to within a day or two of running out of food. And at that time, the head of the UK's countryside agency, Lord Cameron, declared that the country was nine meals from anarchy. Since then, we've seen in uh, 2010 to 2011, floods in Queensland, which saw Brisbane, for example, come to within one day of running out of bread, while regional centres um, uh, were subject to quite severe food shortages. So I think these kinds of acute crises serve to expose the vulnerability of modern food systems in industrialised nations, which are characterised by just-in-time inventory management, uh, long supply chains, and considerable external dependencies, which are rendered, I think, altogether, altogether too neatly on diagrams such as this one. But more on that later. Today, climate change and resource depletion present, I think, larger and more persistent uh, and insidious threats to the food systems that supply modern cities. Local food production, uh, within and around cities is often promoted in this context as one potential means to both lower the environmental overheads and increase the resilience of urban food supply. Uh, and indeed, urban food production has long loomed large in environmentalist imaginings of sustainable cities. However, there's been relatively little dedicated analysis of the opportunities and constraints associated with efforts to increase food production in urban areas which is where perhaps history can come into it. Uh, always context dependent and certainly never a sure guide to the future, I think history can nevertheless shed light on current issues by offering answers to two key questions. Firstly, how did things get to be this way? And secondly, how might they be otherwise? How could they be different? Of course, history also has an important storytelling role. Uh, and I think the otherness of the past in general can illuminate uh, the reality of our present situation by making it strange, by highlighting aspects that we often overlook. But posed in relation to the food system as a whole, these two are quite enormous questions. So today I'm going to be focusing on the Second World War, which I think is a potentially useful case study uh, as it presented considerable challenges to the Australian food system, which was rapidly adapted in response. And in particular, during the war, the government played an important role in expanding the kind of industrial agriculture that we now see as quite antithetical to sustainability, while at the same time encouraging home food production. Uh, so a focus on the war really illuminates sort of potential issues around the rapid reorganisation of food systems. So just to set the scene for you, prior to the war, uh, except for potatoes and onions, and to a lesser extent pumpkins and swedes, vegetables that supplied or that were consumed by urban populations were grown in or around the cities in market gardens. Um, and for the first few years of the war, the problem for commercial food producers wasn't one of shortages but surplus. Uh, the reduction in export markets due to the contraction in available shipping space meant that primary uh, producers were fearing industry collapse. So this surplus food uh, was a concern for around two years and during this time men in um, primary industry were permitted to enlist in the armed forces. However, after Japan entered the war uh, and American food supplies were diverted to Russia, demands on Australian production increased. Uh, 
Uh, the Australian leadership felt obliged to maintain food exports to Britain at the highest possible level. Uh, they were also providing food to allied servicemen and women in the region and, of course, Australian civilians. So in, with these demands, the, these extra demands on the Australian food system, in 1943-44, um, significant shortfalls were expected. Uh, for milk, 818 million litres. For meat, 150 tonnes. For eggs, 29 million dozens. For canned fruit, 1.22 million cases and 87,000 tonnes of vegetables. So how then did the government respond? Well, firstly, by a mechanisation of cropping and extension of commercial cropping to new rural areas, and they had guaranteed contracts as an enticement uh, and lend-lease arrangements with the US in order to bring in uh, machinery for this uh, the, uh, expanded mechanised production. There was also a dramatic expansion of canning and dehydrating, especially for service rations, but also for domestic consumption. Uh, rationing, <clears throat> what we generally think of in relation to food in the war, uh, rationing of some foodstuffs for domestic civilian consumers, tea, sugar, butter, meat, and in some times and places also eggs and milk were rationed. And there was encouragement for civilians to grow vegetables and keep hens so that they could provide themself, themselves with vegetables and eggs. Uh, so th there's fascinating histories of all of these areas, but today I'm going to be focusing on this, on this last one, the encouragement of civilians to grow vegetables and keep hens. So Britain, use, uh, which was facing serious food shortages, had begun using the Dig for Victory slogan as early as 1939, uh, while in Australia there were sporadic efforts to encourage um, home food production uh, in, from 1941, although they didn't attract a great deal of support. Uh, by 1943, however, the position was looking sufficiently serious for the Commonwealth Department of Common, Com uh, Commerce and Agriculture, working with state departments of agriculture, to launch a large-scale Grow Your Own campaign. Now, this campaign strenuously encouraged home gardeners to grow their own vegetables, and there are a range of reasons uh, for this. They stressed uh, the need to reduce demand on the commercial food system, uh, also as a substitute for the rationed items, so you were getting less meat but you could eat more potatoes, um, and also as a kind of insurance against poor, against poor seasons, pests, manpower difficulties, fuel and rubber shortages and so on. Uh, and also to encourage savings, which were instead supposed to be put into war bonds. Uh, movies, radio broadcasts, public demonstrations, competitions, posters, newspaper ads, brochures, even stickers on bills from utility companies uh, were all used to get the message across. Uh, so here's a couple taken from the newspaper. Th that was the Grow Your Own logo with the spade in the middle. Um, some of them were quite um, uh, sort of informative. The idea was to, sh to tell people how to grow their vegetables. And there was quite a lot of controversy in the archives. There's lots of complaints from the departments of agriculture saying, you've given the wrong advice, we can't plant carrots now, uh, and so on. Uh, and also the, uh, the pictures associated with these ads are quite informative, particularly from a gender perspective. Uh, the effect of the campaign in urban areas is really difficult to gauge with any precision. There was nobody going around actually finding out, you know, interviewing people and asking them whether they were growing their own uh, vegetables, at least in 1943. They did that in Melbourne in 1941, but sadly there's no 1943 uh, version of that survey for comparison. Uh, but estimates suggest that between 5% and 20% of Australian households' vegetable production uh, was self-supplied, or vegetable requirements, sorry, were self-supplied. And anecdotal evidence suggests that uh, it was home food production was widespread in, in particular areas. Contemporary documents and oral histories also provide insights into the nature and limitations of this kind of rapid transformation of urban agro-food networks. Uh, the problems that arose were largely to do with inputs. For example, pesticides. There were shortages of nicotine sulphate, lead arsenate, and even derris dust, so some of the really nasty pesticides and also some of the nicer ones. Uh, which meant that invertebrates took more than their usual share of vegetable production. And this was especially problematic because the white cabbage moth had only just arrived in Australia, in Perth in 1939 and in Melbourne in 1941, just in time to eat your wartime cabbages. So commercial yields declined. Uh, in some areas they were really decimated. 
uh, and non-commercial urban food production efforts were probably likewise uh, impacted. Certainly uh, the evidence I've seen suggests that at least some suburban gardeners just gave up on growing the brassicas altogether, the broccolis, the cauliflowers, the cabbages and so on. Uh, then there were seeds. Seeds had mostly previously, to my great surprise, been imported from Britain before the war. Uh, but under war conditions they came firstly from the US and also from New Zealand. Uh, and a domestic seed industry was very rapidly established, partly under Commonwealth government control using prisoner of war labour. Rubber was another one, uh, which it became virtually unavailable to Australia after the Japanese occupied much of Southeast Asia. So garden hoses, for example, couldn't be replaced. And there were some irate letters from Perth gardeners saying, how are we supposed to be able to garden in summer without a hose? You know, we're going to have to be carrying buckets of water around. Uh, water, the thing to put in the hoses. In 1943, Adelaide and Brisbane faced water shortages, and in 1945, the Grow Your Own campaign was wound back in Sydney due to drought and associated water restrictions. Fertiliser. Now, cows and goats had been excluded from many urban areas uh, in the first three decades of the 20th century as middle-class citizens, along with their health departments and municipal councils, pursued visions of modern cities of consumption. And it was definitely a class-based movement at the time. Most of the people keeping um, uh, goats and cows and, and fowls even uh, were working-class people. And it was a middle-class vision of cities of consumption that largely saw those animals excluded under local government regulations. But ungulates and fowls play a, a key role in nutrient cycling in sustainable food production. And without such animals, it's very difficult to maintain soil fertility unless you bring nutrients in from elsewhere. Now, during the war, artificial fertilisers like ammonium sulphate became unavailable. They'd previously been imported from the UK. In the UK, they were using their ammonium sulphate for their own agricultural expansion as well as to make explosives. Uh, synthetic ammonia plants were constructed in Australia during the war, but again, it was, they were um, solely devoted to the production of explosives. Uh, even the use of blood and bone as an organic fertiliser was restricted because that was diverted to pig and poultry feed. Rock phosphate was imported from the UK and Palestine, um, and that was uh, difficult, it was expensive. So superphosphate made from the rock phosphate was subject to rationing and subsidies for commercial growers. So for domestic growers, artificial fertilisers were expensive and hard to come by. In some suburban areas, horses were still used for transport uh, and there was fierce competition for their manure. So one of my um, oral history informants recalled that several people in the street had a little bucket and shovel ready for, for when the horse came by and that people used to be really savage if they'd miss out on the droppings of the horse. So um, alternatives included composting, although this also required inputs in the form of garden waste and skill and so forth, and its nutritional value for plants is limited. Okay, so the upshot is that crop plants demanded nutrients. They demanded nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, and this became a real problem for home gardeners uh, when the usual fertiliser supplies were cut off. Finally, of course, there was labour. Uh, many able-bodied people had joined the armed forces and others were working long hours in war jobs. So this left relatively few able-bodied urban residents uh, with the time to devote to a vegetable garden, particularly as the wartime shortages that I've just talked about made the whole gardening process uh, more labour intensive. Participation was encouraged uh, firstly through an appeal to patriotism. So, for example, the Australian controller of foodstuffs, J.F. Murphy, declared in January 1944 that the householder who makes, it, makes a success of home gardening uh, is rendering a real service to Australia and the United Nations, while he admonished those who didn't do so as, quote, persons who have neglected to do something which you could have done and should have done in the national interest. Now, although the propaganda uh, often showed men engaged in the manly labour of digging and providing for a family, much of the garden labour was undertaken by women. Uh, there was the Women's Land Army, which was involved in some urban cultivation, although it's generally associated with rural food production. The YWCA also established a garden army of women who established and worked community gardens uh, on public, private or private land in, um, in the various cities, mostly in Melbourne. However, in the Melbourne outer suburb of Sandringham, for example, the council offered the YWCA 10 acres of water, uh, 10 acres of land with water to grow vegetables, but the offer wasn't accepted, presumably uh, because of a lack of available labour. 
So prior to the war, vegetable gardening was generally understood to be men's work. However, during the war, women's role in vegetable gardening was increasingly acknowledged. It was understood as part of their responsibility for the health of the family. So as you can see there, women's weekly readers were told that every woman who owns a garden plot and can use a spade or wield a hoe should cultivate a vegetable patch for the sake of her family. Uh, later on in the article it said the day may come when every cook may have to become a gardener or let her family go without vegetables. Uh, for some, market, uh, vegetable gardening also had class and ethnic dimensions associated with market gardening as a lower class occupation dominated by Chinese and mainland European ethnic others. Uh, at one point it was suggested by, uh, within government circles that civil defence workers might help the wives of servicemen uh, with their vegetable gardening. But this provoked an angry response from some wardens who complained about, quote, the humility suffered by suggestions that we may become market gardeners or the like. So calls for householders to engage in productive gardening were framed primarily in terms of responsibility to nation and responsibility to family. Uh, the promotion of, um, of women's vegetable growing as an extension of kitchen work and a commendable duty to family embedded traditional gender roles in the modified networks. Uh, others, as we've seen, inscribed food production with particular class and ethnic meanings which shaped their refusal to engage in it. So what does this mean for us now? Were the modified networks more sustainable? I'd say no. If anything, the expanded commercial production was less ecologically sustainable. Indeed, the war played a key role in developing the large-scale mechanised monocultures whose resilience and sustainability, or lack thereof, concerns us today. The expanded domestic production wasn't uh, particularly socially sustainable, but a, a, a short-term kind of response to a crisis. Though the changes that, the, that we've observed uh, were effective enough in that nobody starved and exports were maintained, as we've seen, some aspects of them were problematic. Did, did this episode in the war transform our material relations with the food system? Well, yes, in somewhat contradictory ways. On the one hand, it rapidly industrialised vegetable production, and on the other, it exposed the complexity and fragility of the food system, and it increased some residents' physical involvement with the production of food. In this sense, it points to a government's capacity to engage urban residents with the food system as both citizens and consumers. However, for many urban residents, home vegetable gardens were a temporary phenomenon. Much like air raid shelters, they were established quickly and after the war they were taken up quickly and replaced with a swimming pool. Although, of course, this is a, this is a generalisation. I'm well aware of that. But there were significant changes, of course, in um, uh, uh, vegetable production after the war. Uh, I wouldn't say that it stopped altogether, but certainly it diminished. It would have diminished relative to wartime production. I think probably the, those changes are more related to changes on the, on the supply side, changes in uh, vegetable production, the mass uh, production, mass marketing, the changes in retailing, making it a lot more convenient for people to go and buy their vegetables uh, from the shop, and also changes in, le in, in leisure. Some people did see vegetable gardening as a leisure activity. After the war, leisure was more about getting out in the car, going for a drive, getting out in the caravan, and so on. So there were a range of social changes after the war that contributed to um, a, a diminution of urban food production. Okay, so what might this episode then tell us about resilience in food systems? Well, there's a few obvious conclusions. Firstly, not only are long food supply chains vulnerable to disruption, the same applies to uh, supply chains of agro uh, food production inputs, such as fertiliser. <clears throat> such as fertiliser, I think it's the input side of things that's often neglected when we think about supply chains. Secondly, it's unlikely that rapid transformations will produce resilient and sustainable agro food networks, at least in the short term. Uh, although in the Second World War the Australian food system expanded rapidly, including the increased amount of urban food production, uh, that system was really kind of wrenched into place and it's not surprising that as a result of that many of the connections that were required for it to run smoothly and sustainably were severed or missing. Thirdly, and I think we all realise this, food systems have class and gender dimensions that shape the extent and nature of human participation in them. Less obviously, I think it points to the kind of messiness and slipperiness of food systems. 
when a well-resourced federal government attempted to control a national food system, it achieved a consider quite a considerable degree of success, thanks largely to the special powers derived from uh, and kind of common sense of purpose associated with the war. However, the government's level of control was far from total. It was thwarted, for example, by insects, by weather, by non-compliant individuals, by economic geography, and also by the unpredictable dynamics of a nearby theatre of war, to name but a few. When we see a figure like this one, we often imagine the food system to be something singular, comprehensible, something amenable to human control and direction. However, in reality, the many networks that make up the food system are so complex that they cannot all be represented, let alone controlled. Also, although the food system is one in which humans exercise a disproportionate amount of control over non-human animals, humans are not the only factor that shapes the network's operation. Weather, invertebrates, bacteria, viruses have long intervened in food systems. So history also points to the limits of human control and the mismatch between intentions and outcomes. It suggests that we, as humans within particular and social material contexts, lack the capacity to intentionally create a sustainable food system that is fixed and final. What we might do as consumers and citizens is eliminate, through legislation and consumption choices, elements that are clearly unsustainable and unethical, such as factory farming and encourage and support the growth of diverse enterprises and networks that seem to be both ecologically uh, sustainable and socially just at both local and global levels. So to conclude, the experience of Australia in World War II suggests, I think, that there is potential for urban areas to contribute meaningfully and sustainably to resilient food systems, but such components will not develop overnight. They will be diverse and they'll include community gardens, peri-urban small farms, community supported agriculture and direct purchasing, and home food production. We also need to find ways to reintroduce productive animals into uh, urban settings in order to kind of close those nutrient loops. It's another lesson learned from the war. However, urban food production, I think, will be but one component of resilient and sustainable food systems, which will be hybrid and which will be cosmopolitan. Since colonisation, Australia has been part of a globalised food system, first as a net importer of food, then as an exporter. Uh, even during the Second World War, increased local production was not principally seen as necessary uh, because Australia was running out of food. It was all about maintaining its position in the broader global food system and particularly in relation to its allies. Uh, unless we move people to where food is produced and all except diets entirely determined by local production, the food system will continue to be global. Uh, in this context, effort to shifts, uh, efforts to shift towards more resilient food um, systems must ask where the burden of resilience work will fall and also seek to ensure that new networks don't achieve greater ecological sustainability at the expense of social justice. Thanks.